Papatra and British, Tom, our Dean, Tom Fraser is here as well. And thank you all the people that are here and those of you online. Really kind of embarrassing to listen to all of this. I wonder if <laughs> but I can tell you it's been a lot of fun to do all of this here at USF and it's, I'm really proud of it and very proud of the people that I work with. So thank you for all of it. really a lot of the work that I'm going to talk about depends on all these other people. It's not for me, but I mean, it's, it really is built on the work of many other people. So let me see if the presentation shares it. Can you minimize the? We need to minimize the teams. Got it. Yeah, distinguished professor can do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. So I'm, I'm going to tell you a story that's quite eclectic. Things that other people are doing around the world. Some of the stuff that we're doing at USF and how we're going to channel that. Uh, together into a, a program that is part of the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. The decade is running right now, goes to 2030, so we're three years into the decade. And the question is, well, where are we going? Are we moving in that decade fast enough? And I, I don't know if you know the structure of the United Nations. There is probably three dozen decades running at the same time on different things. There's a decade on ecosystem restoration right now going on at the same time as a decade of ocean science for sustainable development. And so where some of these decades are set up, they, they highlight issues, but they're not brought together by the people playing the role in those days. So that's one of the things that we're trying to do, trying to bring some of these things together, different groups of people that, that are participating in the effort of trying to understand, can we do sustainable development what does marine life have to do with that? And so that's the whole point of the, of the kind of thing that I'm doing. So a little bit of background on you about the ocean. And this is relevant to all oceanographers here. The ocean covers most of the planet. 70% of our planet is covered by water. And uh, not only that, but it's also deep. It, it is much deeper than the mountains are high. So the Land elevation is on average 840 meters high, but the ocean is on average almost four kilometers deep, and it goes to all the way down to 11 kilometers, the Challenger Deep in the Mariana Trench. So all of this space in the ocean is living space. It's, it's actually over 90, close to 99% of living space on Earth is aquatic. So life, uh, life is nothing new on this planet. It's been around for a while, and it's been changing the planet in ways that we don't think about every day. Life in the ocean deposits material, so it creates things like the cliffs of Dover, but it also changes the atmosphere in very important ways. So we, the life in the ocean put oxygen, which still maintains the oxygen in the atmosphere. Photosynthesis is very important, but it also plays a role in other uh, greenhouse gases, for example, in carbon dioxide. And so I'm not going to get into that, but there's a big role of life in, in shaping what the Earth looks like. And that's the only planet we know where this happens. So the Earth is very unique because of life. And it's not uh, much. So some of the things that, that uh, are of re relevance here is we're living through it right now is climate change. There's no question about it. Anybody in marine science, anybody that looks at the planet, sees that it's changing, and we have a big role to play in that, and we're changing it. There's no surprise, and, and it, it is okay, except that we're not managing it very well. So planet is warming up. It's warmed over a degree over the past, uh, since, since the 1900s or before. And life is affected, and life also affects the way that the planet is changing. So how, how is that? Uh, and what are the impacts on life, especially life that we depend on or our own life? 
But if we look around and try to understand how much of the ocean is explored or how much do we know about the ocean, because it's so big and so deep and the conditions and water are so difficult, it's not very well explored. This, for example, this map shows the their, their records from a program called Seabed, Seabed 2030. It's an effort to map the ocean bottom in a very detailed way. And what you see here is the holdings right now. There's only tracks of ships that collect data and most of the ocean is not covered. And yet wherever you look, wherever you put a robot down or a probe or, or you put a camera down, you'll find life all the way to the bottom of the ocean, all the way in the middle of the water column, between the surface and the bottom of the ocean, there's life everywhere. But, uh, so this life is also very diverse. There's uh, you know, a number of things that not only play a function, but are useful to us. But in general, it's just curious that there's a, a lot of life and different types of life in the ocean. But uh, on top of all of that, we have a very close relationship with the ocean that we've developed over time, from culture and religion, to jobs, to food, transportation. Most of our transportation happens in the ocean. We derive energy, both mineral, oil, as well as renewables. And there's a lot of materials that we extract from the ocean, including medicines. <clears throat> so the what we call the blue economy, the ocean economy, is estimated to be about one and a half trillion dollars um, every year around the globe. That's expected to double, you know, by this organization, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, estimates that the blue economy is going to double uh, in just a few years, by 2030. In the US, there's not invisible. There, uh, there's over $370 billion a year that depend on the ocean economy. It, uh, there's directly related uh, 2.3 million jobs, and that's in all these uh, areas of transportation, fisheries, energy. Tourism is one of the biggest. Now, the OECD also estimates that not only is this going to grow, but this is going to impact biodiversity, but it also depends on biodiversity. So all of these things that are uh, underlined here in red, from fisheries to aquaculture to oil and gas and, and wind, they either affect life, or, and we have to worry about it as an environmental impact statement, or it depends on life. So many of these jobs uh, in the economy are directly related to that biodiversity. So everybody around the world, all the countries recognize that biodiversity and uh, sustainable development are an issue. And in the mid 2000s, in 2015, they came up with this uh, framework, they call it the Sustainable Development Goals and Agenda 2030, that is intended to trace a map or some, provide some steps and goals and targets on how do we get there without uh, screwing it all up. OK, so that it goes all the way from poverty and how do you have equity in, in sharing the resources and the economy and uh, dealing about land and climate. All of these things are in, in the sustainable development goals. One goal, uh, sustainable development goal 14, has to do with the ocean. So the, uh, it, it, it is one way to focus attention on resources that the ocean provides for people and how we manage sustainable, how we manage development sustainably. So a lot of the story that I'm going to tell, you, tell is how does this, how do we, what we do contribute to the sustainable development goal, even though all of these goals are related to each other. So is ocean development sustainable? I think that I can answer that right now, but one thing that we're trying to understand is whether we know enough about, about marine life to say, well, sustainable development is impacting it, you know, or can, can we change the way that we do things so that development can be sustainable? And especially some of these things that we call ecosystem services that we depend on, which depend on biodiversity, if we can keep them going. So right now, out to our knowledge, the way that we, we, we look at Life. We try as scientists. We try to classify things. We identify. There's almost two million uh, species that we have been able to describe. There's a lot of that we have not been able to describe. And uh, in the ocean, there's about 11% of that. So it's about 226,000 uh, 
described species. There's new species found every day in the ocean. And there are species that we have not yet described. They're dark taxa, things that especially are being discovered through eDNA or DNA or type of uh, my, uh, my, microbiology from a molecular point of view. A lot of these are bacteria and my, microbes that we have not been able to name, but there's a lot of life, and yet this is sort of the distribution between land and or, or the earth and the marine world. And yet, uh, some of the studies, this uh, person, Ben, ben Halpern, he is in Santa Barbara, We're trying to understand, many of us are trying to understand, but this is an example of how and where humans have impacted uh, life. Okay, so the truth is it everywhere. And uh, there's really no surprise about that. If you think about where we fish, where we've, where we develop for energy or other types of mining or where we cruise with ships uh, or what we're doing with climate, it, the impact is global. And yet you see some red areas where the impact is much higher. And that's especially around uh, developing or, or about developed nations, but also some of the developing nations. So we know that our impact is uh, happening through the warming of the atmosphere and the ocean, but it's also causing sea level rise. And so there's a lot of impacts that are not visible here, but that are starting to be quantified. This is an example by the Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network. They're trying to get together data from around the world on how our coral reef, these, these are shallow water, tropical coral reefs, not, not the deep uh, cold water coral reefs, but the shallow tropical coral reefs the, in the aggregate are declining. And that's starting to be measurable to the point where, you know, in the last 10 uh, years plus, they've decreased uh, by over 10 to 15 percent. So that and that's noticeable not only globally but also locally in the Florida Keys, and I'll, I'll show you that in a moment. Another group is uh, trying to measure very specific groups of species uh, under what they call the Living Planet Index. It's very hard to think about how you measure biodiversity given the broad variety of things uh, that live out there and the way that we manage our own science. Uh, most groups of people measure their own uh, variables or their own groups of species, and it's very hard to compare that around the world. So groups like this are trying to develop standard indicators. The, this Living Planet Index measures just a few species around the world. And what they find is that some of these, like coral reefs, are decreasing, and their extinction risk is high. Uh, there's other groups of species, and for example, some of the sharks are all starting to decrease, and these are all relative to 1970. Uh, uh, some, we know that there's been a tremendous amount of loss in numbers of species of birds. Uh, marine mammals are under pressure, and so while we're not on a crisis mode yet, there are some places where that is starting to happen. And what's driving this is this group the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which is the biodiversity equivalent to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC. The IPVES uh, has concluded that, uh, well, this is happening. The, the, these, this increase in the extinction risk of some species and the decrease in the abundance of some organisms and some species is because of climate change, because of fishing pressure, and because of land-derived pollution. Those are three major drivers, and they're all related to human activity. So how can we contribute? So at USF, we have, we have had many projects, so there's many groups of people involved in looking at biology and biodiversity in, in different ways. And so our group has been trying to use satellite data uh, as one tool to estimate where there's food in the ocean for other things to eat. And one way that satellites can do that is by measuring the color of the ocean. Uh, if the water is not blue, the water is green or brown or kind of reddish, that means that there may be more food. And so see if satellites can detect the difference between blue and green and blue and brown. And what you see in these pictures, the global picture on the left-hand side 
it's been transformed. It's, it's, it was a picture of the chlorophyll in the water around the world. And what we did is we sort of estimated how much of that reaches the bottom of the ocean. So all the way down to the bottom, four kilometers down and beyond. And what happens is that as, as particulate matter falls through the water, if it's organic, so if it's living stuff falling through the water, four kilometers down, it decays, it rots. And it rots more or less in an exponential way all the way down to the bottom. So this picture is a is a, an example. We have a time series of these of how that particular matter that is reaching the bottom of the ocean looks like in different places. And what you see is that there are patterns. I don't know if you can see the mouse, but there's patterns sort of in the middle of the ocean where you either have very high uh, carbon flux, organic carbon flux, because the productivity at the surface is high, or because the water depth is shallower, like the mid-ocean ridges. So what we thought, well, can we compare this amount of food reaching the bottom of the ocean to the diversity of fish at the bottom of the ocean? And so there's a lot of people that try to measure and look at fish and other creatures at the bottom of the ocean. So I teamed up with some of them, and we compared on the right-hand side, what you see is the same kind of thing where we have an estimate of the particular organic carbon flux to the bottom, and we did a time series of that, and we compared it to the number of fish species uh, on the bottom and through the water column. And what you see is that the water column itself is not very rich. This is, of course, in the middle of the ocean, but once you reach the, you reach the bottom, the highest diversity of fish is at the top of these mid-ocean ridges, and then it decreases as you go down the sides of these mid-ocean ridges all the way to the bottom. And that is completely correlated with the amount of food that is reaching the bottom of the ocean. Okay? So that's one example we're trying to uh, quantify not only who lives there, but how is it possible for them to we're trying to do that closer to home here in this program that is that we call the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network for the Southeast US. So this is one of many NBON projects and NBON teams. Here, uh, this, this ship is actually out there right now. As we speak, there's a group of people from USF, from the from the state of Florida, Fish and Wildlife, and from the University of Miami, and from NOAA, from the uh, lab in Miami, where we go out every two months and we sample these green dots in South Florida. The point here is to try to quantify not only the physical chemical variables, but also at the same time, the biological variables that uh, the things that are in the water, phytoplankton, uh, fish, whatever you can think of, we take samples of these and then we bring it back and we try to build a long term time series and compare it to other things. So this, this, these are some examples. People are there right now. The the blue ship that is on your right is what's out there. We use the University of Miami ship as well. Uh, and again, this goes out every two months. And we're working closely with the National Marine Sanctuary in the Florida Keys. So this has another component. We're, we're working with this with the state and the federal government to look at what happens on the reef itself. So the ship goes around it. The reef, you know, all the way up the west coast of Florida, all of the reef itself, in the shallower areas, there's divers that go and sample the reefs. So what we do with our data is we try to synthesize it. We try to say, well, this is the way things are changing. One uh, of our students, uh, Cara Estes, uh, drive these time series plots of the abundance of reef fish. And so looking at many years since all the way back to the before 2000 of reef fish in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary in areas that are protected. There are some areas really quite small that are protected so you cannot fish. And then the rest of the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, you can fish, so we call it unprotected. And it turns out that the biomass and the biodiversity, the number of species of reef fish in protected and unprotected areas at the moment is more or less the same, and it's been stable for many years. So there, it's not changing in a way that is negative, which is good. Uh, so that that's a, a relief to see. What is changing in, in this, this is a little bit of a messy graph, but if you look at the, uh, at the bottom curve, what is called coral cover, 
coral cover. This is not the diversity of the corals, but the amount of coral coral cover in the bottom of the Florida Keys that has decreased substantially uh, since the 1970s, especially, but also measurably since the 1990s. And so something is changing the amount of coral reef cover in the Florida Keys. And there are some correlates. For example, there's the, the amount of algae, the macroalgae growing on the reef is increasing. So the suspicion there is that there is something that has to do with development, uh, with nutrient inputs coming from the land that is affecting these, uh, the coral cover and stimulating the algae to grow. We're also trying to go back and use the satellite data, the, the same ocean color information. We also measure temperature and other things from satellite uh, sensors. In this case, we're trying to construct something that we call seascapes. And so we take the color of the ocean, we mesh it with temperature, and we measure it with sea surface elevation that is also measured by satellites. And we come up with a biogeographic sort of kind of a, a description, an automated description of the, what the env environment should be. And then we compare it to what we measured from the ship. So the, the white dots that you see on the map in South Florida are stations collected by the ship and we collect phytoplankton samples. So we were trying to see if the color of the water the, the, uh, at a certain temperature and at a certain sea, uh, sea surface elevation matches different groups of species. The idea there is that eventually, if we figure this out, that we can be more predictive or we can more quickly understand what lives where using these satellites. And so that's there's a lot of push by NASA, including a new mission that is going to be launched in about a month. It's called PACE that is dedicated to understanding the diversity, the biodiversity of the ocean. And so the point is trying to do things like these where you match what you see on the ground with what you see from space and can you make sense of it. I'm not going to go in, into the details, so it's just the concept. We're also trying to do similar things uh, using satellite data, but also ground data, looking at seagrasses. Is seagrass cover around Florida changing? And so we are making these maps of seagrasses around Florida. We're doing that in Belize. This is a, a map of the depth of the water column, so bathymetry derived from space in and around Belize. And we're also doing uh, work on trying to map mangroves. So all of these are uh, habitats that are important for other creatures and for people as well. In this case, we're working with Maya Trotz, our group here. This is, this is work for some, some of my students, uh, Claudia Baron, who you heard before, looking at the mangroves, for example. The idea is to see, are things changing? And are these environments changing because of our development along the coast? Or do we need to protect these environments in part because they protect? And so that's the 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 effort uh, that Maya Trotz is leading under Strong Coast and Blue Gap. Are are there nature-based solutions to um, protecting the erosion uh, that we see because of sea level rise or just because development? And the question is that everywhere we're looking, things are changing, or mangroves are chopped down, or there's something that is affecting these coastal environments because there's development that is not carefully managed and therefore affecting the very things that we're trying to, to live from. So in terms of, if you look around the world, the truth is in this, I'm gonna go out a little bit into the, the issues that we have with data uh, around the world. Well, there's a group that has been trying to do this very, very seriously, very, very systematically called Biotime. Biotime has, uh, over 12 million records of measurements of life there. Unfortunately, they're not all about the same, but they have about 361 data sets in a, a long time series, over 100 years of time. And wherever they look, it looks a little bit different. So it's very hard to make a statement that biodiversity is changing or biodiversity is decreasing, which we hear a lot, and yet it's very hard to quantify. And the reason we say biodiversity is decreasing uh, without having all the data sets that we need, because we know we're changing the planet in a way that we think is affecting the habitat where things live. So sea level rise, temperature rise, pH uh, change, so it's becoming more acidic, changes in the ocean concentration. So all of that compresses the habitat of many of the species that we depend on. 
this is an example. We work a lot with a group called the Ocean Biodiversity Information System, or OBIS, which lives under the UNESCO Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, and another group called Global Biodiversity Information Facility. These two groups are sort of the open public repositories of biodiversity data that you go to if you want to find out uh, uh, if there's some measurement someplace. The, the map here of the globe that you see that is almost empty is a show is a is a map of the number of records, any record, no matter what. Just is there a measurement of some type of marine life in the upper 20 meters in the world's ocean? And most of it is empty. And this goes back 150 years. You know? So that the if we want to compare satellite data with an open source biodiversity information, it's really difficult. There, there, most of the world is not doesn't have ground truth if you want to compare something, and especially this aggregated over 150 years. If you look over time, the upper right-hand corner of this graph, if you look, uh, there's a, a blue and a red line, it shows a big decrease since 2010. One of the problems is that we have issues moving data into public databases. Uh, people don't really want to share a lot of data, especially biological data. So we're trying to convince people to at least share something that is commonly monitored around the world, some phytoplankton species or phytoplankton biomass and some fish. So if, if we want to understand how the world is changing and you look at the amount of records of marine life in public databases, it falls precipitously since 2010. And so it's very hard to say that things are changing just because it takes time for people to put data into these databases. Okay, so it, that that's uh, uh, something that we need to change. We need to find a way to move data into a public repository. And it doesn't have to be all the data, but it, hopefully what we're trying to do with what I'm going to cover next is there, there may be some way to identify specific variables that we can share and more openly. If you go down in the water column, it's the same. This is also data from Obis. All the colors in these little squares mean the number of records of anything. It doesn't, it's not even the same type of measurements, but any records of marine life in on average in the world's ocean. As you go down in the water column, you have less and less and less. And, uh, so we know very little about the interior of the ocean. We know more about the margins in the coastal zones where it's, of course, easier to measure things. The information that we're trying to talk about here is kind of fundamental for national priorities, establishing uh, coastal management plans so to understand if, uh, the, if there's an impact of water or clean water or clean air or, or fisheries on some type of resource. If we don't have good time series, we cannot tell. And internationally, People have organized these conventions, either the Convention on Biological Diversity or the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, the High Seas Treaty, you know, that was just uh, signed uh, a few months ago, and trying to understand how and what do we know about marine life in the ocean. All of these are international conventions that point to one thing. They need data to, to understand. This is not new. People have been talking about we need data and we need to understand how things are changing. The same way that we measure weather and we look at weather over a long period of time so that we can uh, not only understand change and measure climate change, but we can then forecast what's happening. That happens because we, we have good measurements that are shared around the world. That The re recognition of that was in the mid 1900s. In the 1990s, we recognize that this has to be done for all ocean variables, so temperature, salinity, and all the biogeochemical variables, but also marine life. That was decided under the Global Ocean Observing System back in 1991, so 30 years ago. And it didn't really happen on, until 2000 when the a private group in the Alfred Sloan Foundation funded what we call the Census of Marine Life. That was a major $650 million by one private entity, and then other groups put and leveraged that money to try to census the ocean. It, it was kind of a very large effort to try to map 
and quantify species in the ocean. But that well had a finite time, 2010 that ended and nobody picked it up. So the, the, the US government and other agencies around the world decided to establish something under what they call the Group on Earth Observations, the GEO. The Group on Earth Observations uh, formulated a plan to have a biodiversity observation network or GEO bond. That happened in, in the mid 2000s. And under that, we established the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network. And in the US, several agencies, NASA, NOAA, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management decided to fund some of the projects to contribute to the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network. And that's what happened in 2014. So a first set of projects in the US was initiated and at the international level, Japan established an NBON, the Europeans established a, a set of projects and so on. So this is the, the story of NBON. The US, there's many agencies involved. We work very closely with it. Uh, with the National Marine Sanctuaries Program and other programs at NOAA under what is called the National Ocean Partnership Program. The National Ocean Partnership Program is a mechanism for different agencies to fund projects together. And it's a, it's a miracle of federal funding for science in the, uh, because otherwise agencies cannot co collaborate and putting things together. One of the main goals of MBON is to uh, stimulate data flow. How do you get people to share the data in a way that is interoperable so that we can compare different places and compare things over time. We cannot do that for everything. Obviously, we cannot measure all species everywhere all the time. So we have to come up with a formulation on focusing the community, very large community internationally, doing this, collecting raw data, using standards to collect the data, hosting and curating the data in standard ways so that would think that that's normal. Libraries do this all the time. Not normal in, in marine science. So, and then you have to generate the information so you can use it and make decisions. And they, so they have to view the data and understand it. We need to find it, use it, et cetera. And we, we also want simple tools for people to watch, to see the data. Things like what we are trying to put together below it. We call it an infographic where you have simple representations of habitats, like the Florida Keys, you click on a fish silhouette and you get a time series. We found that resource managers don't have the time to dig through any different types of data. So they, they have to have simple tools like this. We're trying to do this all over the place. In the US alone, and this is not complete, this is a map of the different MBON projects that we're working with. Uh, we're in the southeast U.S., so we cover all the way to about Cape Hatteras, work all the way to, in, to Texas, working closely with, for example, the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary or the Grace Reef National Marine Sanctuary, as well as the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. But this is happening around the country from Alaska all the way down the West Coast. There are new projects coming online to be announced within the month or so along the East Coast. So. We're also trying to do this internationally. So a lot of the, and I'm not exaggerating, a good part of my day is trying to coordinate a lot of these groups uh, through the, the Group on Earth Observations Biodiversity Observation Network, but also many different projects in Europe, uh, all the way down to the Southern Ocean. Uh, let's just say there, Everybody is pointing in the same direction. The point the, what we're trying to do is come up with some standards so we can inform uh, managers, decision makers on what is it out, what is there out there, where is life, can we protect it, should we protect it, and how can we manage development in a way that can be sustained so that not only our generation but future generations can benefit from that. So not to protect to stop development as to how do you manage development so that you can move forward and everybody benefits from it. So in after the uh, sustainable development goals were proclaimed in 2015 or so, there, were, there was a, all of a sudden a lot of focus on how do we contribute on the ocean. The idea came up to have a, an ocean decade or a, or a decade of ocean science for sustainable development. And that was proclaimed in 2017 
but it didn't come online until 2021. So in 2021, a lot of us were working on this and we decided to make a proposal to help the decade, the, what we call the ocean decade, uh, have a focus on marine life itself. And so we proposed this program that called Marine Life 2030. And so that there's a, probably 40 different programs under the ocean decade, some that focus specifically on molecular techniques, some focus on fisheries, some focus on education, some focus on early career and trying to mentor researchers. So there's it's it's worth to to know about it and to get engaged. The ocean decade, uh, the framework, and if you look at the objectives, it's all about information. It is it's a very clear realization that it, if you want to make decisions, you need to be you need to know what's there. You know how it's changing, so you need to know trends. And you know you need to be able to forecast, and we cannot do that unless we have information. So the information is uh, the, the the groups working on this are working on these challenges. There's ten challenges. Marine Life 2030 deals with three directly, but it's not that we don't connect to the other ones. So protecting and restoring marine biodiversity and ecosystems, expanding the ocean observing system. And education. So, how do you how do you bring new people into this around the world? And we do that through these concepts we call essential variables. Uh, this is not a new concept. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, except to say that there is essential ocean variables that the oceanographic community has formulated as a way to measure physics and climate or biogeochemistry, but also biology. And those are those are requirements that are defined by these international treaties that we capture and try to say, well, they, these need to be measured this and that way. So the essential ocean variables are a way to capture the requirements, put it out into a practical data collection effort. That then gets translated into what they call essential biodiversity variables under the GeoBond umbrella, which is effectively just gridded observations put in a time series. So they're like data cubes so if you want to measure biodiversity changing over time uh, and space, you need to aggregate it into these data cubes. So e EBVs, essential biodiversity variables, are nothing but the essential ocean variables that are synthesized in a, in a map. So these are the essential ocean variables. We try to make capture the requirements for phytoplankton, zooplankton, fish, and marine mammals, and also certain habitats like corals or microalgae and so on. There's also essential ocean variables for ocean sound. Passive sound is a, becoming a very important tool to quantify what's happening in the ocean. Not only human noise, but also what's what is what is there out there. A lot of creatures make noise and they can be recorded. And ocean color is another uh, essential ocean variable. All of this is we try to package it into what we call a framework for ocean observing, where the ocean decade and the global ocean observing system at UNESCO capture the requirements that people and agencies have. We try to organize the community around standards for collection and data management. We pass that information to the GBIF and the OBIS of the world, the, these databases. And then there's many different groups that aggregate that in what we call indicators. So, and that go, goes back in a feedback loop. This is happening right now. For example, in the Florida Keys, we're working with NOAA, NOAA AOML, uh, in the state of Florida are, are in, very involved in restoration efforts. There's a lot of people doing very important restoration. If you did nothing, saw before that biodiversity in the Florida Keys probably would stay stable, coral reefs would continue to decrease. Uh, so, one thing is the biomass. And what you want to harvest, maybe, or see, the other is biodiversity. If you did nothing, it would stay in the trajectories that we have right now. If you restore, if you plant things, you may be able to recover some of the benefits that we derive, fish and, and, and tourism. So one of the efforts is to do that, but we want to monitor the success of these restoration efforts using all these different methods, from eDNA to acoustics to satellite data, Bring out with ships or robots or whatever we can. So there's a lot of technologies that, that are now coming online. And again, this is probably way too much to go over, but there's 
techniques that are now more easily deployed. You can collect a, a bottle of water, and look at the DNA that is floating in that bottle or sample of water. That we call that environmental DNA or eDNA. You can now have little cameras that you can put in, in the water, either on robots or on or on, on a cable. You have uh, platforms that are robotic, or you can have ships, you can have buoys, and now we're advancing modeling, uh, well, modeling of life in the ocean. All of this is what we are trying to put together as, as an observing system, where we collect the requirements, we define how we're going to measure things, we establish and define the platforms that we need to have, we establish a data flow uh, framework, and then we try to put this into models. All of these boxes right now sort of happen independently in, in the marine science community. They're not very well connected. This value chain has to be better connected if we want to have uh, better power of making decisions. So this is where the ocean decade has come. Three years have gone by. The ocean decade doesn't have funding, which is a a major setback for how you change things. So it's all trying to convince people that you need to do things in a different way, but the decade itself doesn't have the funding to do that. So we're, they convened us back on the third year, and they asked, well, how can we change the way that people behave around the ocean? Can you provide a new vision for the ocean decade? And so this is the ocean decade vision 2030 process that is leading to a conference of the Ocean Decade in Barcelona in April. So we're all busy. There's 10 groups around these 10 challenges, trying to redefine the vision of the Ocean Decade on concrete goals that we that we can try to address by 2030 and beyond. So I lead one of these groups with a colleague from Malaysia on what is Challenge two. Challenge two is on protecting and restoring ecosystems and biodiversity. What we're trying to push is not a new idea. We're trying to say we all need together to come together around ecosystem-based management, which is you know, probably a 50-year-old idea. It's not new, but it's not happening. Okay, so this we know it has to happen. And then we need to provide the information through science to inform that ecosystem-based management. So that's the the, the message. And we're trying to come up with concrete goals on where we get, how we, get, how we can get there by 2030. So the conversation topics around the ocean decade is sustainable development. This is not about, it's not the, the decade of ocean science. It's the decade of ocean science for sustainable development because we're screwing things up. And if we don't change things based on information, we're going to continue to do things in a way that is probably not the, the best. You all can play a leadership role. Every one of you can be engaged and push for some of these concepts. And so uh, I welcome you to join us in, in these efforts, both in MBON and participate in trying to push common language, common standards, common ideas for data flow. Do this internationally under the umbrella UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. Thank you. So I'd be happy to try to answer that. I have a comment. I'll go ahead with questions because I just have a comment. Sure. Um, so first, uh, thank you for a nice talk and also congratulations on a well well deserved, well deserved recognition. Uh, I my my question was more so aspirational, you know, the Sloan Foundation donating I think six hundred and fifty million dollars to this cause and that uh run out of those funds has seemed to coincide with the impact uh, of uh, decreased uh, submissions to the repositories. What would you do with another 650 million? Uh, like how how would that change your approach here, uh, especially given that you know the, the decade has no such funding? The decade itself doesn't have the funding, but different groups are trying to contribute. Our goal is to organize the different efforts that are out there uh, in a way that recognizes those different groups and convince them that there is a, a way to share some of the information they're collecting and put them into OBIS. OBIS was established 
by the census of marine life. It was a, uh, created during that time to hold the data from the census. It now was adopted by the that's called the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, and it lives on and it has evolved. So it, it has evolved in a very magnificent way. Now you can store time series, you can store uh, biology data. So, and there's ways to capture very detailed information about biomass. It, it started with a presence absence kind of uh, record. So much of the effort is trying to educate people that these tools are now available and that uh, the message is not, hey, share all your data because people are not going to do that. And it's costly to convert all your data into a standard format. But if we if we collect the data in a way that was more standardized and from the beginning, when we collect data that we submit to NASA, for example, if the protocols for the submission were such that followed some standards, then that data can be shared much more broadly and not used by just one group that is interested in and for example, validating ocean color. So that's what we're trying to do. A lot of the effort that we have right now is identifying new technologies, convincing people to bring down the cost of these technologies, and can we move toward more standardized collection of some variables and then store the data in a way that is more accessible in, a, in an interoperable way. So we will not believe how hard it is for people to pick up that simple message. So a lot of time spent in trying to do that. So we need it. I think it's very important to do that. My analogy is to do something like what the meteorologists do. It took them and took physical oceanographers decades to share some data, but they share some data, they share it globally, they share it real time, and it feeds into the models that we use every day to look at weather. So it's doable. It's just the community has to come together and. Not like there's no investments in measuring life. It's just that it's very. Yeah, thanks, Frank. A, a nice talk. I just want to follow up on Brian's question. So, we, I mean, as scientists, we recognize that the world's changing, right? Um, you know, and largely because of our actions. And with regard to the ocean, um, you know, there's changes in physical and chemical characteristics and warming like you said in particular or ocean acidification um and these are global issues right uh, but we're not in a position beyond that to really predict or forecast with much confidence how those changes will affect um biodiversity or, or resources um, that we extract for for our own needs um and what you pointed to in the talk was the fact that we need information, right? And so that's data collection, investments in science, and that requires money, right? Not just uh, the, you know, the philanthropic types of things that you alluded to, um, but whose responsibility, in your opinion, to, to provide the funding for the science that helps inform policies, management interventions, and things of that nature, because clearly we have limited resources. I guess I'm trying to figure out if you were king for the day, right? How would you assign that responsibility? Is it the federal government, the, the state government, is the international community? How are we gonna get there? Yeah, thanks, Tom. There's many layers to that question. Uh, one is, at the moment, if you think about how the science community is focused on specific parts of this elephant, the people that are measuring pH go out on ships and they go measure pH, but they don't measure biology. So there's there's a there's a responsibility on the science community to recognize that we need to work more closely together and measure things in the same places at the same time if we're interested in trying to predict the impacts of pH changes on biology. Okay, Otherwise, things are based on a lab measurement or some theory that may not have anything to do with reality. So that's, I think a lot of that responsibility is on our side. In terms of the funding, I think that it's great that 
philanthropy is interested in some of these things, and there's a lot of philanthropic money now being offered and being pursued by the science community at all levels, but it's not enough. I, I think that the only way that we can organize, because that's part of government is protection of life and property, right? That's the, that's the role of government. And this is part of that formula. If we don't see this part of protection of and property, then missing a role in government. The governments around the world, the national level, have to deal with this at their national local level. So at every level, there's a government entity that can do something. Can we do it in a way that can be aggregated so that the international level, we can measure it, what will change? Okay, so we're doing that with temperature. We're doing that with uh, like winds and things like that that are, I'm not going to say easy to measure, but they, they are, we've learned how to measure them. It's taken us decades. But to measure biology and changes in biology, to do the same thing at the local level and coordinate it at the national level, and then coordinate, coordinate that at the international level is very difficult. And you need national governments to put money and coordinate to do that. So to me, in terms of the funding and the priorities for management have to be coordinated and defined by governments uh, internally and then internationally. I don't know if I'd like to hear your perspective, but I, I think that this idea that philanthropy is going to solve the problem is, is only part of the effort, but governments in the end have the, res the, the responsibility to organize all of this and fund. I think I'm trying to tie to yours comment. And first of all, thank you so much. This is like something I probably wouldn't have made myself go to, except that I work in the provost office and I found it fascinating. And I found a lot across the kinds of uh, problems that you're having with data sharing and data standardization. Those go across everything. And I'm more in a healthcare field and I'm like, oh yes, and we're doing the same thing. So that then touched on me in terms of getting those messages to the people who are going to be voting, right, to put the people in the government who are going to make these funding decisions. So given our lack of data literacy in this world right now, what can the college and us do here to help build those messages in ways that others out there can can understand them. And I think you're hiring, uh, co-hiring a science communicator. And I thought that was fascinating. And us, we as scientists, and maybe you can touch on that, need to be able to give those messages to groups outside of this in ways that resonate and want them to take action. So I just wanted to comment on that, that I, it's brilliant. And like, you talk to me now, now I gotta go home and talk to my husband who, I got to do it in a different way, if that makes sense. Well, thanks for the question. Uh, I think that even internally, even a unit, uh, an, an academic unit, and this is replicated everywhere around the world. We all work as a little independent uh, empires, if you will. We have to get the money to advance our own science uh, questions and we try to address that in a way that is limited and constrained with our own group and the amount of money that we have, which is very, very small, often and very limited. I think that we can work with a lab next door and coordinate how they're measuring things is a huge obstacle, even within our own units. So we don't, we have not learned that even if we didn't do everything the same, there are there things that we could do together uh, in sharing data using similar formats, can we get the data flow using common protocols, using common databases? So I think messages like that on how you can do that to help county or the state or the nation or more broadly, that philosophy hasn't, hasn't permeated our culture and, and that message I don't think it's a new message, but in part because of need and the way that we drive research and the way that we fund and complete research, it's very hard to, to make it happen. Okay. And so it's like that if there's a common message that you want and, and working towards sustainable development is you need to do this together in a way that information flows to serve, solve certain problems 
together, and that requires standards. Engineers have figured this out. You know, the engineers use standards. We don't use standards in science, uh, or, or maybe let me put it the other way. There's probably too many standards, uh, and we all choose different standards to follow. That's a problem because many times things are not comparable. I, I want to just make one more comment and then I saw your hand up there, which is totally different. I was actually listening to a webinar last week about emerging fields that we might think about for our new pro academic programs, et cetera. And of course, AI is top of the list. But it was funny when you talked about ocean sounds or it hit me when you talked about ocean sounds. And I'll just throw that out there to everybody because they said one of the emerging fields of study that they see because of student interest, et cetera, um, had to do with digital bioacoustics. And I was thinking about digital bioacoustics related to ocean life. And when you said that, so maybe we can get a seminar, I couldn't teach this, but a seminar or a course or something across a couple of disciplines, people who know acoustics in the ocean and maybe get some students interested in that. So it's an emerging field that they see as potentially students at the grad level, even undergrad for wanting to do majors. So I wanted to throw that out there. And when you made that ocean sounds, it was like, oh yeah, I just heard that last week. So just throwing that out there for the people who could take action on it. And then there's a, there's a big effort in the terrestrial community to measure sounds in terrestrial ecosystem. So can we can we work on standards so when we process a sound file, it's done the same way on the terrestrial side and in the marine side, and it flows to the same databases. Because to me, it doesn't matter if it's a freshwater environment or if it's the Pacific or the Southern Ocean uh, or if it's a tree, it's life. And it is, we, we share that characteristic and there are metrics that you can measure together in a standardized way and put it all in common databases. The new certificate program next week, Thomas. <laughs> I'm all about this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it's we would be cutting edge for us, right? And that's and they mentioned Purdue had a soundscape something, they're doing something in institute. So anyone who's interested, pick it up and go. I'll help. Well there's a it's not really an emerging variable. It's an emerging variable in ecology. The Navy has been using sound for a long time, of course, but there are patterns in sound that you can recognize and AI is an obvious tool. Thank you. That was my comment. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, first of all, congratulations on your long trajectory. So I'm, I'm in computer science, uh, I'm talking with you. So as a follow up, you just mentioned AI, data acquisition standards, so how can research on computer science can help you impact the, the, the work you've been talking about? Uh, how do you see that? I, I imagine there is, it's pretty broad, but how do you see like, like this? Well, we we'll use computers in every which way to process data from small to big, you know? Big areas, I think, uh, of need for the, for Earth observing community in general is how do you implement standards and allow or help people move data between different formats more easily? How do you publish your data from a notebook or from a spreadsheet into a common format database more easily? That's a huge area. Many people don't move their data because they don't want to spend the time or they don't have the money to spend the time to move the data to another form. So the data stays in a lab computer or lab notebook, and that, that's it. So that's one. Uh, we talked about the possibility of coordinating between sensors at the same time. Can you measure things in a common way, uh, in a standardized way across big geographies over time? So that would be very powerful. And then the idea of pattern recognition, and we've worked with people in the computer science department here forever. Uh, before we used to call it pattern recognition. Now it's AI, you know? but it, it's the same thing. So we, we in satellite data, we work with the people in the computer engineering for 25 years probably. 
or in trying to see are there things that we can identify more easily in the satellite today. So that, that's uh, how can we apply the new AI concepts to that very useful. I mean, many of us uh, are probably not caught up on everything AI and all of these uh, tools. And so how can we team up that so that we, we collect the data, we can provide some parameters, can we make more use of it? But then ultimately, how can you bring all of these different types of data together? Acoustics, imaging, satellite data, uh, molecular biology data, and, and look at patterns and recognize them. I think that that's huge. It's starting to happen, I'll put it. The idea that it's going to happen by itself because AI is going to figure it all out, what you hear, is probably not necessarily true, and ideally you want to control the process. So, so I really found a lot of this information and it's really, a bit really helpful um, on the student, and it was very organized and easy to follow. So I really appreciated Sorry. that. Um, <laughs> you never know how it's going to come. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought it was very helpful. Um, so I'm a master's student. Um, I recently attended my first conference. Um, so I'm studying biogeochemistry, and I'm really interested in the applications of that for conservation science. And one thing that I noticed at the conference, and again, this was my first time, so very new to the field, was there was a bigger division than I expected between academic and then like industry or government research and that division of who's, how are they doing it? Um, and so I was curious in, the, in terms of the sharing the data and the challenges with getting people to share data and to upload it. Um, do you, in your opinion, is there a difference in fields there, like in an academic versus a non-academic space in terms of how well this information is conveyed? There's uh, very, very big differences, and some of those differences actually quench the flow of information. No question, some industries invest in research to advance their own products, and so they have a, an intellectual property attached to that that is uh, difficult for academics to compete with. And so academics often clam up uh, from many points of view. They don't want to put out there something that then somebody else is going to make money from. And that's a big driver for quenching the flow of data from an academic point of view. Or you don't want to find somebody's thesis or or, or have somebody scoop their, their thesis because uh, you put the data out there. I think that uh, on the other hand, if we were able to identify a certain or limited set of metrics or, or essential ocean variables that we can decide, okay, let them meteorologists decide about air temperature, humidity, you know, so, so a handful of variables that you can then aggregate more broadly and everybody benefits. Then there's an industry yet that you can base on on top of that and have value added products. That may be one model to pursue, but uh, Right now, there's a, a lot of obstacles on the academic side and sharing data because of that concern that somebody's going to scoop them and they can participate in that, or from the industry side because they don't want to give up their property. So it, it's a tough nut to crack unless you define the problem a little bit better and decide that if we want to understand certain things about fish and all the fisheries program better measure things in a more standardized way. Right now, fisheries agencies measure different kinds of fish in different ways, and the data are in different parts of, of data, and they're not in a common database, and they're not in common. So even just within uh, resources that we need, we know and we have mandated to manage the data management frameworks are not very well defined, and so on. And so uh, I, I think there's there's a lot of work. Thank you so much. I want to echo her comment about your presentation today. I, that was what I was trying to say. It was fascinating and well done. And 
I, I know all of you know a lot. I don't know a lot about this field, but I learned so much. And so that's, I really want to thank you for that and say congratulations. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Brooke, are there any questions online? Well then, thank you so much, Professor Miller Carter. Thank you. Those of you who are physically here, please help yourselves to snacks. They're still okay. Thank you. Continue to socialize. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Nice meeting you all.